Hi everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fragrant Bunker. Today we're doing the top five Chanel perfumes for the month of December. Ah, it's the end of the year. You could say, finally, it's over, but you could also say, oh, it's kind of nostalgic and sad. It was a beautiful year for some. I don't want the year to end, right? So there's a lot of kind of opinions about any given year, really, but 2023 in particular has been hmm, saucy, to say the least. So anyway, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. You can uh, push the notification bell to get notified every time I post a new video. You can push the join button next to the subscription button to become a member today and get access to extra perks. Thank you to all my members who have already pledged. This video is being filmed live in front of a live virtual audience. I live stream several times a week on my main Super Jacob channel, so come join me over there to partake in the live chats. Now, top five Chanel fragrances for December. Uh, because it is the holiday season, it is the end of the year, you know, there's a lot of festive situations happening. You're either going to, uh, if you're working, uh, the office holiday, traditional holiday dinner. Uh, you know, the job doesn't give you a raise, but they pay for the dinner once a year, right? There's that. Uh, meeting up with friends, meeting up, of course, with family, with loved ones. There's a lot of uh, parties. And then New Year's Eve comes along. You know, the culmination of holiday season is with when New Year's Eve comes along. So there's a lot to consider here. But most importantly, what we must never forget is to celebrate ourselves. That's kind of something that we tend to forget. So these perfumes and this selection of perfumes, just bear in mind, is made to make you enjoy and celebrate yourself. You know, pat on the shoulder saying, you know what? I did it. I made it through another year. You know, and IYKYK, it's getting tougher and tougher. It's like with every new year, we level up the ratchetness. We level up the difficulty level. It just becomes harder and harder. So celebrate yourself. This is kind of at least... Um, my way of, uh, of seeing things, right? So let's begin the celebration with a wintry beauty, a sandalwood beauty. And we're going to go hardcore here. We're going to go elevated and we're going to go with Bois des Iles as our first fragrance. I adore Bois des Iles. I do have the Eau de Parfum here. Little sandalwood masterpiece. What can I tell you? You could also, you know, purchase uh, the little sister of Bois de Zille, which would be Egoiste. Different take on sandalwood, but uh, Egoiste is a 20s fragrance from Chanel, and uh, Ernest Beau is the nose behind it. It has gone through reformulations for sure. You could also still purchase the extrait of Bois de Zille. They still make the extrait, and of course, the Eau de Parfum. The Eau de Toilette. Um, has been discontinued in 2016. So, but I'm really fine with the current formula of of Bois d'Azil in Eau de Parfum concentration. Now, it's it's a very very creamy version of um, of a sandalwood fantasy. Because it has a bunch of ylang ylang in it. And the ylang ylang is um, a very deep, throat filling, no pun intended, creamy, almost kind of nectar like consistency in this perfume, right? So you get that nectar version of sandalwood through the ylang ylang, a very, very interesting woodsy composition. And I mean, Bois de Zille in the 20s. Uh, the the forests or, or the woods of the island or of the islands is the name of it. You know, in the 20s, there was a particularly second half of the 20s, this whole concept in Paris, Europe, of um, escapism, really. And uh, back then, very popular. The terminology that nowadays is perchance a little bit outdated and not very politically correct, but the term exotic, oriental which of course we don't use anymore. But back then it was a totally normal thing to say. And there was the, the entire fascination of also black skin. Uh, and, uh, you know, look it up. There's the, and you can't even say the word, but the 
soften it down. It's called The Black Review in Paris uh, with uh, black artists, dancers, Josephine Baker, big exponent. And that entire flair and allure of the different, at least in Europe, back in the 20s, led to an entire faction of perfumes being created to envision traveling to faraway places, imaginary, idyllic landscapes that Europeans don't have on a daily basis readily available to them. So perfumes in, in that era started to be developed and conceived and formulated as visions of faraway lands and faraway trips. Okay. And this is exactly what Bois des Îles is. And in fact, it's called Bois des Îles. It's a fantasy forest envisioned on a fantasy faraway island somewhere in the middle of nowhere, really. Uh, and uh, where, you know, Chanel's clients would travel to, at least in their mind when they smell Bois des Îles. And that's kind of what you get. You get a 20s version of an idea of traveling far away. Nowadays, you need a, you still need a budget to travel, but it is much easier today to travel than it was back in the 20s. You know what I mean? Also, technology has advanced. It's easier to also go places. So that uh, need to conceive perfumes for faraway travels is kind of not necessary today. I think we have other priorities, sad priorities. I think brands are more concerned nowadays, perfume brands, in creating fragrances that are easy and inoffensive to wear, you know, at the office. Like that's priority number one. Make it easy, make it fast, make the head notes work. That's all we need to sell Bottom line, we got to make money. The poetry is gone, people. Let's not beat around the bush about it. The poetry is gone. The perfume world, just like the fashion world, it's dead. So we, we look for the poetry in the past, mostly. And all of these creations and recipes from the past are the ones that still move us the most if compared to the rest of the perfume world that we have today. Yes, you have a lot of conceptual, artistic, architectural even fragrances being launched on a daily basis, but what do they give us? They give us maybe a concept of a smell and then they don't really go deep into the dry down and the smell in the dry down isn't really that poetic, that moving. Most of the time it's very synthetic. Aroma chemicals are used and abused nowadays in the perfume world. So it's not like there's a lot of poetry. You're going to have a lot of niche houses that are going to be promising you the world if you purchase one of their perfumes. But then you purchase their over, in most cases with niche, overpriced fragrances. You get the perfume at home. You smell it kind of interesting, titillating opening notes. And then as the dry down kind of comes closer and closer, the the whole composition just becomes a huge mess. It's not masterfully composed. It's not masterfully, the separation of the ingredients is not really done for them to kind of blend and then detach and reattach. And it's like a musical score. There is no pathos, you know, the, the pathos is gone right? That's at least modern day perfumery for the most part. But anyway, enough of my rant. This is really good in December because it allows you to kind of escape your own world. You know, that's the idea of Bois des Îles and go to faraway places in your mind and allow yourself to kind of pamper yourself, to enjoy yourself, to be back with yourself in a place where nobody is annoying you. Nobody's knocking at your door saying, "Hey, do this, do that, but when you do that, hey, you got this, that, fulfill this task, finish this, this, this job, you got to do that." None of that. This is something not to wear in the office. This is something to wear at home. When you come home and you need your moment to be alone, it's December. It's the end of the year. You're done. You did a lot this year. Let's take a minute to pause and pamper ourselves. That's Bois de Zil. the escapism in perfume form. I adore it. Number two is the festive occasion. Number two takes us on a New Year's Eve journey. The New Year's Eve journey is a platinum and diamonds, honey. You're going to be sparkling. You got to be bubbly. Champagne is pouring and you are partying. And uh, I'm envisioning, again, a very 20s type of style, a very, very 
low-waisted dresses, skirts, a little bit dapper for the guys, but whatever, wear whatever you want. Important thing is the perfume, and the perfume from Chanel for December is 1932. I envisioned this one for the end of, of December. Uh, this is a very, very, very much New Year's Eve Chanel fragrance to me. It's decadent and bubbly and festive. Uh, and it's it's festive not in a religious way, you know, it's festive in a very 1932. The whole concept of this perfume is the Chanel Diamonds and Platinum collection. The only high jewelry that she designed, Coco designed, was She Was Alive, which was released in 1932. So this perfume is an homage to the 1932 Platinum and Diamonds collection. I do have a Chanel Platinum ring here that I always wear, and it's kind of my way of homaging also her 1932 collection. Very simple. You're not going to see me, you know, wear the pompous versions of... Also because Chanel doesn't do platinum anymore, by the way, just FYI. You know, they only do gold at this point. I don't know why they stopped doing platinum. But anyway, I got one of the last platinum rings they ever made, and then they stopped doing them. They might start doing platinum again, but this is kind of connected to the 1932 collection. And this is a beautiful aldehydic kind of sparkly accord. Very festive. This is really, really, really beautiful for that Charleston look. You know, a lot of beads, a dress that's very glitzy. And then very, very, very much being in tune with your own self while you're celebrating the end of something and then the beginning of something new. The end of a year and the beginning of a new year. Love it. 1932. This is the Eau de Toilette, by the way. I still have a little bit left in my Eau de Toilette bottle. Um, they do the extrait of 1932, and there is, of course, the Eau de Parfum. I have not tested the Eau de Parfum lately, so I don't know how the current formula smells. I do love the Eau de Toilette because... Uh, sorry, did I say Eau de Toilette before? I have not tested the current Eau de Parfum version concentration of 1932. So I don't know how the current Eau de Parfum version smells, but the Eau de Toilette is particularly incredible to me because it's cold, like a diamond and like platinum. I have a sneaky suspicion that uh, Olivier Polge, as he always does, has to kind of, you know, <laughs> fart in a perfume to warm it up. And uh, I have a sneaky suspicion he warmed this one up too. This one is supposed to be cold and sparkly like a diamond and platinum, not too warm. This is beautiful when it's colder. And it has a powdery note in there as well. Really gorgeous. Uh, number three, and I'm telling you, we're going all out uh, in this selection. Uh, costly, but you got to celebrate yourself for the end of the year. So I'm very, very particular. Celebrating December and the end of the year with you, your best friend, which is also usually your biggest enemy when it comes to criticism. Your best friend knows your weaknesses. You've shared some stuff with your best friend that you often think, oh, why? Why can't I start off on a clean slate? Why does my friend have to know these things about me? You guessed it. That friend <laughs> is Misia. Misia in eau de toilette form. I'm not a fan of eau de parfum. Just saying. Maybe they're going to tweak the eau de parfum, make it good again. But it's that warmth that Olivier did in the Eau de Parfum. It's really messy to me. Which is strange because Misia was Olivier Polge's first perfume for Chanel. I do believe that his daddy had a finger in this one as well. Because Jacques was still not gone from Chanel. Olivier was just entering Chanel. And that's when Misia was released. Misia was advertised Eau de Toilette. Misia was advertised as Olivier's first perfume for Chanel. Oh, the nepotism of it all. But I do love Misio de Toilette. I have two bottles. Um, what can I say about Misia? It is a violet bomb, raspberry, aldehydic, <clears throat> irisy, oris rudy, powdery, violety accord. That goes really deep. It's intrusive. It's aggressive. It's amazing. 
It's Mizia being Coco's biggest friend and enemy. It was the frenemy. It was Coco's frenemy. So this is why I say Mizia is that perfume for December. You know, when you're spending the end of the year with your best friend, who's also your biggest enemy, because they know way too much about you. And they regularly use it against you when you fight with them. So it's a we'll go, we'll go, I wake up, wake situation. Same with this perfume. It's a love hate relationship I have with Mizia. Um, I cannot stand it sometimes. Sometimes it really irritates me because once you spray it on, this little booger sticks to clothes and to skin. It just does not go away. And it has a hell of a temper. And if you, if it has one of those bad days when it has a hell of a temper, it, it just, it turns acidic and it does not budge. It does not wash off. So annoying. And then there are those days when it goes into that powdery accord, when it's not moody and it becomes your best friend. So it's a great way of having a dynamic December. Let's just put it that way with Mizia. Try to get your hands on the auto toilet if you can. The next one, shocker of all shockers, I'm it's growing on me more and more, believe it or not. I used to loathe this one. But we're going we're going big. We're going strong, you know, 200 mil bottles, les exclusives. These prices just keep skyrocketing, but I still love them to bits. What can I I what can I say? I love these perfumes to bits. Chanel I hate that you keep rising your prices with raising your prices without really reason other than in my humble opinion greed. Everything I say in this video is for entertainment purposes only, not rooted in truths or facts. Everything's alleged. So I don't know why they're raising their prices, but a girl. Anyway. Who knew that one day I would put beige in my top list, but I and this is Dior de Parfum. Love it. It, it it just clicked. It just clicked and uh, it works. All of a sudden, it it still smells like shampoo. It still smells like the the cheap version of Chanel for sure. It, I'm not saying this thing smells sophisticated. Beige of the entire Les exclusive range. This is the ratchet one. <laughs> this is the one that. Yeah, it's the least elegant of, of the list, like, in my humble opinion. I know this is a bestseller. Most people love beige, and now you watching me are going to say, well, why are you saying like stuff like that about beige? I love beige. Whatever. You do you, boo. It's okay. We don't all have to love the same thing. But I love it, too. But this is not sophistication, honey. Beige is... You know, politically incorrect to use the word ghetto, uh, obviously, we know, but uh, I might I remind you that this is uh, a word coined by and for the Jewish population in Venice, in particular, the Ve Venetian ghetto, which has nothing to do with the American context. America appropriates everything anyway, so they think they invented the term ghetto. No, honey, you didn't. But anyway, this is very ghetto. Um, for Chanel is exclusive standards, okay? This is bordering to a kitsch that is not in good taste. And I know we don't like to talk about taste on my channel. So there's a lot of complications with this perfume. But it just... For some reason, for me, and I usually have a big problem with Hawthorne, and that's what we got in here. Overload of Hawthorne. For years, I have had issues with Hawthorne. Until now, it kind of clicked, and um, I'm appreciating more Hawthorne. It just, my nose kind of was like, oh, yeah, okay. It's an acquired taste. Let's just put it that way. And and so it, it kind of, it doesn't irk me completely the wrong way. It's kind of intriguing. I want to know more about, about it. So, yeah, so I'm kind of like, 
intrigued, being that this one is the only Chanel that actually has it, really, at least in these quantities. Um, and it has that weird dry down that kind of goes in a musky honey, like a rancid honey, powdery honey accord, which I don't mind. It's a little bit dirty. There's dirt in this thing. You know what I mean? So beige has grown on me. And uh, this is the only Liz Exclusive uh, fragrance that I have not reviewed yet. <laughs> but I will. I know a lot of you have been asking me, like, when are you going to review beige? And I was always like, oh, I, I can't. But we're getting there. Now, beige also exists as an eau de toilette, discontinued. Also exists as a parfum, pure perfume, like, or extrait. And the eau de parfum. So Chanel has made it, you know, in all the concentrations possible. Um, yeah. It's kind of the simple Les Exclusives perfume. Now, why does this work for December? Because for some reason, the hawthorn in here and that honey gives me a, a, a weird warmth with a cooling effect. In other words, this feels like how I feel currently when it's really cold outside and I'm dressed in several layers and I'm all warm on the inside, but then the outside is super cold. So my face gets like super cold. So I get to experience both temperatures at the same time. And then when you overdress, you start sweating. It's such a weird feeling. Like you're sweating under your armpits, but your face is freezing cold at the same time. It's such a bizarre feeling. It's very, very December. Uh, and that's kind of how this smells. It's cold, but also warm at the same time. So it kind of mimics that feeling of being outside with a really warm jacket and several layers underneath but then whatever is exposed to the elements like the face that kind of freezes so that duality is something i sense out in beige which makes it very very december for me so there you go we'll go we'll go number five takes the cake honey number five takes the cake because uh It's the perfume that you wear to really, really thank your body and thank yourself for making it through another year, acknowledging that you are special, acknowledging that you are amazing, acknowledging to yourself that you, you deserve to be happy. You deserve, you know, seeing yourself as the Chanel haute couture dress. You see, we always are manipulated by brand marketing to think that we have to run after that dream of, you know, one day being able to afford purchasing a Chanel bag, purchasing um, an haute couture dress from Chanel for $100,000 and up, you know. But then, no, this month, I want to realize and acknowledge the fact that I am that haute couture dress. I am special. I don't need to wear the expensive accessories and expensive dresses to feel special. They should be lucky to have me as a client because I am what makes them special. I am special. By I, I don't mean me. I mean all of us. You, you watching, you are special. They should be happy to have you. And the perfume that really embodies that rich, tapestry of heritage, of craftsmanship, dedication, time invested and spent in bettering yourself, researching, producing something that becomes a beautiful work of art. It's 31 uh, Rue Cambon. What a glorious, glorious fragrance. Okay. Uh, this is a very modern day Chipra. It um, this is the eau de toilette, by the way. I adore the eau de toilette. Again, Olivier did the eau de parfum a little bit dirty. He warmed it up. He spiced it up a little bit too much. But uh, I have not smelled the current eau de parfum. Maybe he toned it down again, like he did with Sycamore. Sycamore now is really good again. 
because he made it smell closer to the other toilet. I don't know. I would have to test 31 Rue Cambon again in the eau de parfum form, but uh, the eau de toilette, hmm. And when they discontinued the other toilets, I stocked up on this like there's no tomorrow. I have several bottles of this in my collection. So we got labdanum. We got uh, patchouli, a bunch of it. We got the vanilla. We got floral accords. Of course, we have the aldehydes in the opening. We got a bergamotti accord there as well. Vetiver, oak. Well, the oak moss isn't listed on the ingredient list, but something mimics the oak moss in here. It is a rich, rich, deep, sophisticated tapestry. It's woven masterfully, masterfully. It, that's why it bears the name 31 Rue Cambon, which is the headquarters for the Haute Couture of Chanel. That's why Jacques Polge gave it that name. Well, Chanel gave it, you know, the brand marketing gave it that name. But Jacques had the Haute Couture in mind when this perfume was developed, together with Christopher Sheldrake, but IYKYK, this little beauty just, uh, I smell it, and the perfume literally reminds me how special I am. So when you wear it, it reminds you of how special you are. It takes time to learn how to appreciate and love this perfume. This is not an easy perfume to love. But then again, neither am I. Or, you know, neither are you. It's very rare to be that person that everybody loves the second they see you. You're the, you know, the ball of the party. Uh, but usually those people that are that lovable, that likable, and that easy on the eye, but also that easy on the conversation, that easy on the societal form aspect of friendships or getting to know people. Usually those people have the secrets. Usually those people are quite sad and alone when they come home. You know, the comedian type. I always say that stand-up comics are probably the people that have the biggest problems in their lives behind closed doors depression that they're fighting with, troubles that they're fighting with, traumas that they're fighting with. And then they learn to cope by being inoffensive in a way. You know what I mean? Like when you when you deal with these people, you never feel like they're ever going to be threatening to you. They're very easy to deal with, to handle. Always funny. They always entertain everybody. They're always, you know, in a good mood. Nobody's always in a good mood, you guys. That's just a front. Ask yourself, what happens to them behind closed doors? So, I love the honesty of this perfume. It's not that simpleton, you know. It, it doesn't come across as the easy one to love. It's very honest. It, it's difficult to love it in the beginning. It, you need to take your time to understand how this thing was woven, how that tapestry was created, how that haute couture tweed was, you know, made, which materials were used, what was the idea behind not just the fabric, but also how the fabric is then later cut, tailored, and sewn together to create a shape. You know, it's like one of those things, once you know the me mechanics behind something, you learn to love it more. That's the type of treasuring yourself and cherishing yourself that you should be doing all year round. But since it is the end of the year and December comes, it's really, really important to do this to acknowledge how special you are and to not let others bring you down and put you down just because, you know, they're either jealous of you or because they have their own agendas. You know, people always have their own agenda. Let it go. Focus on yourself. This perfume is really beautiful for that. It just so elegantly and eloquently kind of puts the dots on the eyes, marks over the T's, fills an image up, and all of a sudden, just like that, the puzzle is complete. You know, the last piece of the puzzle falls into place, the year is complete, and you realize suddenly that you were that last piece of the puzzle. You were necessary and vital for that puzzle to be complete. You are not nobody. 
You are not unnecessary, not important. You are important. You are somebody. You are necessary. Always remember that. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, thumb it up. Let me know what your favorite Chanel perfumes are for the month of December. And I hope to see you all very soon. Uh, in my next video, you know, thumb up this one. If you've enjoyed it, you can follow me on my Chanel fan um, dedicated account on Instagram called DacobCC, all spelled together. And until next time, never forget to never give up on yourself, which basically means never give up on love. Love you loads. Take care. Bye.